uh, now uh, uh, Father Gabriel is kind enough to be our moderator tonight, and, uh, and very happy to have him as a moderator. He started actually at uh, on Wall Street. He was at Dean Witter and C.J. Lawrence, uh, and then became a priest in 2000, uh, and uh, went to the Angelicum in Rome, and um, uh, now is the provincial vicar for the Dominicans here, uh, and also has a show on Sirius Radio, and has done a whole bunch of stuff on EWTN, and uh, so... Uh, please welcome these gentlemen, and I'll hand it over to Father Gil- Gillen. So, uh, before we get into our conversation, um, I know um, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry was going to uh, tell a little story about when we met and we were discerning what to do with our lives, and uh, I, I'll just let you take it from there. Well, good evening, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks so much for the kind invitation, Jeff. Thanks for the nice on-ramp to this story. We appreciate your leadership and, and all of your willingness to spend a little time with us tonight. But the, to broaden this story about, because Jeff missed a pretty big gap there. He talked about Father Gabriel's time here on Wall Street. Then he talked about his ordination. There was a period in between there where this young man, Hollywood handsome, shows, <laughs> shows up at Steubenville through the invitation of a mutual friend of ours. And there was a group of us at Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio in the middle of the Industrial Rust Belt who had come from all parts of America because we had done some things a little earlier in life, but our hearts were really yearning for more. And there was a group of us graduate students, for the most part, that were a little bit older and had done some other things, and, but had, had left all that in order to go to this little tiny school in the middle of, on the Ohio River, on the eastern edge of Ohio, that had lost tw- half of its population in the last 20 years. It was a pretty desperate place. But it was attracting people from all over the world who were drawn to its magnetism because of its uh, rootedness in the faith and, and the culture that had been created there under the leadership of Father Michael Scanlon. So my good friend, Mark Ropel, who had been an Army Ranger and had done things in corporate world as well, was there studying theology. And he invites his good friend, Kevin Gillen, to come down to see us. And he, he sets him up. He gets a whole group of us together to basically convey to Kevin, um, hope you don't mind me using your informal, yeah, yeah, sure. irreligious sure. name, I guess. <laughs> um, my, my mother still calls me Kevin. So. <laughs> <laughs> to talk to Kevin about the uh, extraordinary things happening at Steubenville. One thing leads to another. Uh, Kevin moves his brokerage business to Pittsburgh, starts to commute back and forth, starts to live with us, and I could see the handwriting on the wall from there. <laughs> Now, this was a man who left his laundry outside of his door, and somebody else came to pick it up and <laughs> lived, lived all that life. And eventually decided that this call and longing in his heart needed the fullness of ex- exploration and discernment and gave up a very successful career on Wall Street and let his business go and spit a, spent a discernment year, a spiritual year, taking some classes but living with us. And he would come home regularly, almost daily, with some extraordinary new spiritual insight. And one day I looked at him and I said, Father, I said, Kevin, <laughs> you have got to start writing this down. And one day we're going to write a book. And we're going and we're to call it From Riches to Rags. Because <laughs> you should have you seen this place we lived in, in the middle of Steubenville. Five guys in a house. I think the rent was 300 a month. Split five ways. We still had a hard, still had a hard time collecting it. And there's this old economic principle, tragedy of the commons. Have you ever heard of this? Um, where things held in common don't get taken care of. That was our house. We closed the house up over Christmas break, and somebody left meat out. And you can imagine that coming back to that. So that's kind of the way we live. So in order to solve this, because I had a degree in economics. I started to charge everybody $5 more per month in rent, and we hired one of our fellow friends to come in and clean. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got through it. But then Father Gabriel, Kevin Gillen, decided to enter into the seminary, and he went to a religious order called the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, which I had not heard of before. 
And the first job he got was sent, was sent into the missions in Kenya, Kenya, right, where he was in charge of feeding the animals. That's where he went, from here to there. An incredible spiritual journey. Now look at the gift that God has given back to him, being a priest in the fullness of this, without having to pay the mortgages and the, and the bills, but nonetheless possessing uh, the wonderful opportunity to spiritually guide the community here. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you about Father Gabriel was that um, that young man, Mark Ropel, who had invited him to come, who was dating a beautiful woman and a mutual friend of ours, he is also now a priest. Now before, he was the last one to come to Steubenville with our little group, and when he was leaving, he got all the guys in a circle. He said, I'll go first, but then you're going to come, and you're going to come, and you're going to come, and you're going to come. And he got to me, and he said, but you. You need to go back to the world. <laughs> I didn't know he meant Congress. I didn't know he meant that worldly. But I thought it was an extraordinary insight for a good, from a good friend to say that we've been given this very special time of, of discernment and faith formation at Steubenville and the philosophical uh, underpinnings of what it means to be a civilized society and it is our job now to take that back out and so I'm very very grateful for Father Gabriel's leadership and guidance he's now a Dominican priest here in New York City as you're very much aware and doing great things uh, in media uh, was the vocations director for a time right but um, I think as part of this new generation of priests who have been formed in the extraordinary tradition of the church and who love it, who do not try to change it or flee from it, but who represent its beauty and splendor in the cultural milieu in which we're set. And I think Father Gabriel's on the leading edge of that. In fact, he told me um, the last time I was here, I think, he said, you know, Jeff, we, I was formed, I'm, I consider myself a, a John Paul II priest. But these new guys under Benedict, they asked me, do you speak Latin? <laughs> What's the matter with you? you know, and they're very, very, very serious. So I think what you're seeing is a, is a new dynamic within the church of, of young men who are, as well as young women, who again are, are reviving the great tradition and are reexamining their lives and what it means to be uh, fully committed uh, to the truth and to be a disciple of Jesus and to be in mission. Where I live in Lincoln, Nebraska, by the way, we have about 50 seminarians. Little Lincoln, Nebraska, the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska. And people say, how is that true? How did that happen? I say, well, it's predominantly due to, to a couple of things. One is there has been a strong line of very great men of character who have been the bishops, who did not experiment with fluffy things, who stayed with the truth and the tradition, who, cre who formed men and Christians and then priests. Uh, where we live, we farm, we're people of the land, and when you work the land, you sort of learn natural virtues pretty early. The cow has to be fed at 4 a.m. You don't, <laughs> you don't have a choice. So that discipline of hard work and family life and neighbor helping neighbor and the religious sentiment that's still very much a part of our culture, even though it's under stress like in most places, gives young men the ability to hear a supernatural call because it builds that that, that natural, uh, the, the grace is built upon, again, the natural virtue. And so that's the benefit that we have. Uh, I just got a text from a young man t a couple days ago. He will shortly be ordained a deacon. He used to work for me. And so I've told our vocations director, I want some credit here. <laughs> he was a young man. He was kind of interested in the sublime. I showed him the profane of politics. <laughs> he fled back to the sublime. So I wanted a little credit. So let me stop there. Yeah. That's not why we're here to talk about me and my situation, but I hope that gives you a little sense of who we are and the extraordinary gift that you have in Father Gabriel. If here. you put a uh, congressman and a Dominican in the same room, we're going to talk a lot. So. <laughs> I, we were here to talk about Pope Francis and uh, some of his statements that he's made. It's uh, making a lot of headlines. And uh, I um, wanted to ask uh, Congressman Fortenberry, uh, about his views because he's trained uh, in theology and uh, and in political science, um, uh, studying at Franciscan University and Georgetown, uh, among other places. And uh, I wanted to first ask you, just getting into it, um, 
Pope Francis recently talked about trickle-down economics and critiqued it, warned about it. Um, a lot of people have questions about what this pope is doing. Um, from your background, what's your understanding of uh, the church's teaching, social teaching, and how do we apply that to ourselves? There's many uh, people here who are involved in business or in uh, various, uh, in law and business, and uh, uh, how does a Catholic um, implement sometimes um, what this Pope is challenging us with with uh, his views on on the economy in general? Yeah. Well, I think it's a, a, a great question, and I think you have to ask yourself, what what is the fundamental here? What is the purpose of business? And the church very clearly lays out some parameters in her teaching. Uh, it explicit, she compl- explicitly condemns communism and socialism, and what's the reasons? Because they're about a collective norm, not the individual person. The church also condemns the excesses of capitalism, lays a fair capitalism, as you will, if you will, uh, because, again, it is inconsistent with the fundamental purpose of our lives in trying to help others. The purpose of business is persons. Yes, it has to have a profit. It has to have a structure to survive. uh, It has to compete, use the benign forces in the marketplace to make good things and good products in an effective and efficient way. It should be a just place where people, again, are able to find um, their niche and utilizing their talents and the fullness of their capacities and receive a just wage in return, and also produce products that create consumer benefit. That's essential. That's where most of life is lived. So I think what the Pope is saying is focus on that fundamental. The outcomes here must be directed toward the well-being of per- persons and nothing else. If they're, uh, if they're overly excessive in, in terms of profit-taking at the expense of persons, if you're making products that are inconsistent with the good of persons, if you're using techniques or have a disposition that uh, cuts corners, that creates an unlevel playing field because you are not ethical in your behavior, that is inconsistent with a Christian worldview. And I think that's the fundamental challenge he's laying out. So one of the questions that are related to this is, you know, on one end of the spectrum you can get into overregulation of business, on on the other end of the spectrum you can have economic unfairness. How do you – there's always a balancing of things. G.K. Chesterton said a heresy is – concentrating on one particular truth and not looking at the fullness of things. How do we um, view the, the Pope talked about a lot of economic unfairness today and some people not getting a voice, not getting certain opportunities. How do you balance that with overregulation of business? Yeah, it's a very relevant point to the moment. Um, I was visiting with the head of Gallup, the Gallup organization recently, the polling people, but they also, that's not the main part of their business. They're the researchers into trends. And um, I'm paraphrasing this a bit, might not have some of the details quite correct, but basically he was saying the economy depends upon a net increase of 100,000 jobs a year in order to have sustainable growth. Not from large corporations, not from medium-sized corporations, but from micro businesses, mom and pop businesses, one to five employee businesses. The economy very much depends upon them being able to take risk, to be entrepreneurial, and to create jobs for people. Right now we have a net loss of about 100,000 jobs from that sector, the mom and pop sector, the micro business sector in the country. And you don't make that up in the large corporations. You don't make it up. So in order for people to have access to good opportunity, in order to have creative power and good wages, there has to be job creation in a country. There have to be people who are willing to take risk, who are going to be entrepreneurial, who are going to put up capital, use their ideas in order to make good things for consumer benefit. They should be able to do so and free to do so in a proper regulatory environment, which has as its goal as well creating a truly free market system where there is health, the goal of the regulatory environment is health and well-being of workers in the production process. What has happened, the Gallup said, we went back and examined the reasons why there's an an outflow of 100,000 jobs from this sector per year. And the answer was two things. 
regulatory burdens, and health care. Well, what was it about health care? I don't know. It's just too complicated. We're just going to keep the people we have. You, you, the, when the government is out of balance in this regard, the necessity for regulation is a truth because you cannot leave the market alone to its own excesses. And yet when it's overbearing, it's undermining the very potential of the market to help people. And that's that balance here. And again, a person simply saying, we don't know why, but we're just going to not hire. It's too hard. It's too complicated. They've made life too burdensome. I used to be on the Lincoln City Council before I went to Congress. I actually retired from that and um, went back to business. And one of our local regulators was coming before us, and I told him, I said, Larry, listen, you have to have the mindset that you're not going out there to get people. You have to have the mindset that you're going out there to help people. You say to the business, okay, here's the standards that we need you to produce for the health and well-being of your workplace. How are you going to get there? Here's our suggestions, how are you going to get there? If you don't know how to get there, implement these rules, and you'll be all right safe harbor for business. But if you have another alternative means, which is more effective and efficient, that is consistent with your needs, we'll implement that. What has happened instead is, especially at the federal level, and I hear this all the time from farmers and small businesses, a very aggressive posture toward business, not simply wanting to partner with business as a regulatory entity to get us to where we have a safe workplace that is proper and uh, it's more of a gotcha mentality and then you have to negotiate and lawyers get involved and it's just a complete mess. So people again don't want to increase their risk profile by hiring because of the overlay of these, this environment, this burdensome environment that has been created at the federal level. I hear this all the time. So it's not to get, say that regulation is wrong or improper, abs absolutely impro is proper. This is the, the market per se purely can't regulate itself in certain areas. That's a, that's a public good. That's a function for government. But when it becomes excessive and overbearing, it actually undermines the very reason that it exists. So as a Catholic, as a Republican, do you see any conflict in what this pope is writing about challenging um, people um, about certain views of the economy or f certain views of economics, again, specifically this trickle-down approach which he's, which he's uh, criticizing. Yeah. Um, isn't it appropriate for a, the Holy Father to probably challenge our thinking? Isn't that an appropriate thing to do? Um, look, I went through the financial crisis in 08. I was in Congress, okay? And I was telling Sean Feeler that uh, I think I came up with the saying, but uh, it was suggested by another congressman that he came up with the saying. But I said it publicly, I thought first. I said, these institutions aren't too big to fail. They're too big to succeed. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll say this to you. The day that all of this was breaking, we've, we've got not panic in Washington, but this intensified level of concern, and the Treasury Secretary is making his way over, and news reports are starting to trickle into us that we've gotten some, the economy is about to seize up. So I called the head of the Banking Association in Nebraska. I said, George, get every banker you can on the phone in the next hour. I have to talk to them. Get them on the phone now. And you know what his response was? What's the matter? Okay, you see the, the tale of two worlds going on up here? Back in Nebraska, we have a lot of small banks. Okay? We had one bank kind of get out of its lanes because they invested in real estate in Arizona and Las Vegas, I think. Everybody else had a portfolio that they were actually aware of and knew the risk of. Those <laughs> entities up here don't understand, well, that's certainly back in 08, they didn't understand anything about, well, not anything, but it didn't understand what was in their portfolio, nor was anyone in charge. So you think about a small Main Street institution where the president and the loan officers know the business they've loaned to, know the families with the houses, know the farmers. And they're watching those numbers with the farmers, and if they see something starting to go bad, they can go to them and say, look, we've got some worries here. What are we going to do about this? We need to adjust this, that, and the other. In other words, that's the relationship. The proper, they're competing 
like anybody else. But the relationship of the, provi the, the provider of the service to the one who's being served creates an ethic, a free market ethic, if you will, because of the smaller entity is proximate and therefore accountable to the people he's serving and vice versa. Now, if one bank goes out of business in Nebraska, it's not a big deal because there's a lot of banks. One bank goes out of business up here, guess who gets called? Me, to bail them out. Now, I think that's not the fullness. I, don't, I didn't read the Pope's document. I'm picking up on the snippets of what people have talked about or complained about. But the whole idea of a concentration of wealth and power in a fewer and fewer hands as somehow leading to the outcome, which the premise of which we first started, as to the well-being of persons, is not measuring up. There is a very we real income gap, and that is for a whole variety of reasons, that some of which are beyond just the economic system, many of which, the social fragmentation and the, and the breakdown of uh, the, in the mediating institutions in the culture, mainly family life and faith life. A child who comes out of uh, a broken home or non-existent family structures, that's where 80% of long-term poverty comes from right there. And so we can't just limit our discussion to the problems of, again, the concentration of power and the wealth in the fewer and fewer hands. We've got to look at this through the whole spectrum of how we revive a true free market that creates good opportunity for persons who want to be entrepreneurial and good opportunity for persons who are simply looking for sound work to survive. I uh, recently gave a, a uh, parish mission <coughs> about Pope Francis, and I, I recommended to people a book by G.K. Chesterton on St. Francis because this pope has been paraphrasing and quoting Chesterton. There's a Chesterton uh, society in uh, Argentina, and he's obviously very aware of his works. Obviously, this pope chose the name uh, Francis. Um, one of the reasons is this need for reaching out for individuals uh, to the poor, uh, returning to a more simpler form of Christianity where uh, this pope is living a... Uh, radical simplicity. But the other reason he chose the name Francis, uh, this pope speaks about is, and Chesterton speaks about it in his book on St. Saint, uh, Francis of Assisi, is not just association with the poor, but those who are intellectually poor. And he says, my predecessor called the dictatorship of relativism, relativism the thing that is intellectually bankrupting our culture and our society. <clears throat> As a Catholic, we, we spoke about this balance that's needed be, between uh, big government, uh, which is bad, and certain aspects of biz, bi, big business, which can actually make it fail. How do, you, how do we balance out this need for um, – I, I know you were, we were talking about this before – for uh, this intellectual poverty w which is going on, people not believing in objective truth the need for this rehellenization uh, of people believing in, in truth itself before we start proclaiming the gospel. If you'd speak to that, how that relates to your, how you see that in policy making and in some of the struggles that we're having on certain issues of marriage and, and uh, pro-life issues. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. It's the right one to ask because uh, Mother Teresa used to talk to us about this. Right? America is the poorest country in the world. She's talking about the spiritual poverty. We get all this materialism and we're very unhappy and miserable and always looking for the next thing, right? And she says, don't worry about coming to Calcutta. Go knock on your neighbor's door. They're hurting and they're lonely. I remember Father Groeschel talking about how hearing, being in the confessional in St. Patrick's, having, listening to people who are of the Jewish faith or no faith at all come in in this city teeming with millions of people they didn't have anybody to talk to. They were so lonely, they go into the confessional. And this intellectual and spiritual poverty which we are experiencing is a real want among our society, and, and we keep politicizing this. We keep thinking there's a political solution to all of this, and there really isn't. Let me get, give you an example. Um, down the street from where I live, it's not in my congressional district, but right nearby, there's this place called Boys and Girls Town. Boys Town, started by Father Flanagan. You remember, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. You, you're familiar with this institution. Well, this is a place that takes in children who were, shortly before that, standing before a judge, and the judge says, you're going to jail or you're going to Boys Town. You choose. Mm -hmm. This is a place where children just show up in the middle of the night because the caregiver of the family couldn't handle it anymore and just put them on a bus. And there is an incredible model of intervention there. 
And it's so successful that about 90% of the kids are able to integrate back into the community where they came from with the tools for self-possession. Historically, over time, a third of the kids at, who have gone to Boys Town, come out of Boys Town, have entered the military. So you think, in a few short years, a, so, a child is so turned around, a child who was on the way to despair or destruction or even death is so turned around that they willingly volunteer for the highest and noblest of causes to defend their neighbor, to defend their country, to even maybe lay down their life. Whereas there is this clear expectation and authority and obedience to authority, how, what is this model of intervention that's so extraordinary? They put the child in a family where there is a loving, caring mother and a protective, nurturing father, where there are rules and discipline and expectation and love. That's what they do. We can't spend enough fast enough in Washington to fix all of this. I'm, I'm telling you. And yet, again, ironically, government politics is one of the last institutions standing that has a, the ability to shape and protect people, to provide some basic level of social safety net, yet there is this deeper wanting and yearning in people's hearts that has to come from the more intimate forms of community. Government cannot create that. That starts with family life, is nurtured by the supernatural grace that the church gives, and is protected in civic life, where the interaction of people in business and in education is informed by this deep principle that the, so that the church clearly, consistently tries to teach that every person is worthy. Every person has inherent dignity and therefore rights. So we've got a two-edged fight here. Uh, we've got to rebuild the culture, and that takes a long time. That's beyond politics. And yet at the same time, politics is one of the instruments out there that has to stand in the middle, this breach of brokenness for the moment, until we can turn some things around. And yet people are yearning for this deeper conversation, I think, I think. Now, as an aside to your question, I think that all of us here have a responsibility to use creative and constructive language. It is not enough to yell at your TV at night at Fox News and feel like you've accomplished something, or MSNBC, or whatever you like. It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not getting us anywhere. It's not answering that harder, deeper question. I think one of the more gratifying moments I had since being in Congress is I was cross, getting ready to cross the street in Lincoln, and this man is coming down the street on a bicycle. And he's a bit disheveled, and I, I don't know his circumstances, but he starts stopping the bike. So I'm like, and I'm alone, and I'm getting my back up, and you got to be you know, a little bit cautious in the business. And he looked at me, and he said, you're Jeff Fortenberry. And I thought, oh, here it comes. He said, you're for the people. And he kept riding. I have no idea why he said that. But in some small way, if I had done something or said something that made him feel connected to me as his representative, and that we have broken through these uh, in, in, insipid, um, uh, unfortunate political constructs that are just divisive, that to me is where we have to elevate our language. Principled, yes, firm at times, but in a manner that's inviting, maybe even as beautiful. And that has to start with the heart. Um, and that's what's so missing from, from politics, unfortunately. I have some more questions, but I want to open it up uh, to anybody who'd like to ask uh, Congressman Fortenberry a question. Can I take the opportunity just to switch the card? Yeah. Do you think you need to switch the card? Yeah. Okay, so sorry, can you bear with me for a minute? So we have, uh, what do we call that in the business, Jeff? We have intermission? <laughs> well, this is your opportunity to uh, say anything that you want on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, Nick with one question. Does anybody else have a question after that? Okay. How does somebody, you know, uh, <laughs> get more involved? How does somebody make a difference? You, you, you said shouting at the TV doesn't work. You know, what can somebody do? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. I get asked it a lot. Um, 
my own pathway to politics, you know, I, I remember when I was, even though I come from a broken home myself, I remember when my father, when I was young, he was asked to run for the school board, and I, I found that exciting, and I loved civics and government, and then became an aide to a state senator, and got a degree in economics and master's in public policy from the Jesuits at Georgetown, then went on and was taught by the Franciscans, so I have this sort of spectrum of church uh, uh, background from the various traditions of the church. Uh, and so my I, that, that call into public service, I think public service is a noble and honorable pursuit I always have, in spite of the cynicism directed toward politicians, particularly Congress these days. Uh, I think our approval rating has gone up. It's now 12%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who these 12% of the people are. I, <laughs> I think it's my mother and paid staff. I think it's, that's who it is. But uh, we have to revive a respect for the institution, and that has to, that's a two-way street. It, the behavior of the institution has to, again, reflect these elevated and noble ideals, and at the same time, the people, you, the people, have to demand them. Now, for all, maybe none of you have a, a direct interest in politics, but we, uh, in terms of running yourself, but we are a people who self-governs. If you walk away from this and don't do minimally what's necessary and apply yourself then somebody else is going to use the power that's given to you. And they may not use it in a way that you like. In fact, they'll take your money and use it against you. And this is why it is so critical that people have to step up and engage in the political system. It's messy, it's difficult, it's imperfect. Um, I'd like to think that, again, if your goal is here, you're not going to go from A to Z real fast. But incrementally changing things, making that which is good a little bit better, stopping things that are bad, not completely, but trying to mitigate them. If, if, if we're not there, that doesn't happen. And we're not there unless you help us be there. This doesn't come from some magical place. Uh, it comes from individual citizens stepping up and getting behind me and other people who, who are trying to make a difference in public service. Uh, and that can manifest itself in various ways. Um, but I think we've got a problem and that good people don't want anything to do with it because it's just messy and ugly and they're all a bunch of crooks. That's what most people think, and yelling at the TV is my cathartic exercise in politics. It's not enough. Nick. Well, thank you, Congressman, for being here. My, my name is Nick DiGiorgio, and I guess my question I had was uh, your colleague, Congressman Paul Ryan, is really going throughout the country and talking about anti-poverty and what, what is happening in our inner cities and what's happening really throughout the country in areas that are economically depressed. I guess I, the question is how... First of all, how is his work going? I don't know if he's definitely spoken to you about that project, but how do you see that as being able to rebrand economic debate as more about the individual, more about the person, as opposed to about the system? It sounds like and Paul Ryan's doing a great job in that. I wonder if that if this, that's how your opinion. Uh, Paul's a good friend. Um, we have had some conversations in this regard. In fact, about a year or two back, uh, Paul said something that I picked up on and I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. I pulled him aside and asked him where he got in the line because I wanted to know who was advising him. He said, we have overemphasized solidarity and abandoned subsidiarity. That is the most, pith the pithiest, most beautiful expression of the current state of the long-held social justice tradition of the church that I'd ever heard. And I said, Paul, where did you get that? I'm thinking uh, George Weigel whispered it to me or somebody, you know, Father Rutler, somebody, or, uh, Cardinal Dolan, somebody. He said, oh, I, I just was in a press conference and thought of it. Th the point being, brilliant mind. And I think he's on a very important journey to pick up the pieces of what the Republican Party has, not in its essence been, but it's certainly reflected in rhetoric and maybe even disposition. I'm sorry if you're well off, you cannot have a contempt for those who are not well off. And sometimes that comes across like that. You know, it, 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 you know people who have, have had bad strokes in life through no fault of their own or who have, everybody cannot be an economic superman. That's the reality. To be an entrepreneur, to run a business is a very hard, complicated thing. I used to be in business and, and, and do have some investments that we still have. It's hard. It's complicated. It's not for everybody, nor should it be. But therefore, the business person has a particularly special vocation and call 
to take care of those who have been placed under his or her authority. Not to regard them as means of production, not to think of labor as another part of the production process, but to think about the person that you are specifically hiring and what they bring to the table, yes, in order that the business can be competitive, but what you bring also to them in terms of the gift of the economy. To speak in language like that, instead of expecting people to be economic supervillain or writing them off as the 47 percent, is a, is a rhetorical mistake and a disposition that has to be get gotten rid of if it, if it does exist. I think most people on my side of the aisle are well-intended and very good-hearted and have done all of those things for the most part in their own personal lives. But for whatever reason, we've gotten pegged as the party of the rich, the party of laissez-faire capitalism, let them eat cake, the 47 percent and all of this stuff, which is very, very destructive. So I think Paul is doing a great service because he's been given a gift himself of significant responsibility within the Republican Party structure to begin to, to turn this in a new direction based upon this idea that, listen, the federal government is going to have some role in this, particularly, again, in this time of deep brokenness and woundedness, and particularly given that we have um, very important legacy programs that have protected people, Social Security and Medicare, mainly. I was on Social Security as a child. My father was killed when we were young. That helped get us through. Now, I am where I am probably through the grace of God, first, not probably through the grace of God, but probably also that I had an extended family and access to good education and a stabilized community around me. You think of the child that doesn't have that. Now, is it their fault that they can't achieve? They were set back by this social dysfunction in which we're living in, by the brokenness and woundedness, and that's not fair to them. So we start where people are, first of all, and not expect them to be way over here, but at the same time not speaking down to people. We are partnering with people to try to come up with constructive solutions that flow from an authenticity of care. And that means that we, we very carefully talk about government so that it doesn't just look like we're slashing and burning, but we're trying to be fiscally responsible because no one is served by fiscal recklessness. Mm -hmm. Okay. But at the same time, we talk about important programs that have given people security when they have nothing else and how they are going to be strengthened for the next generation and so that people in them approximate to them aren't going to be are, aren't frightened by that. But the very first thing you have to do before any of this policy construct is one thing. Show up. We had a gentleman who was uh, he's an African-American I can't remember his name. I, I, if I remember correctly, he's an actor. Came and spoke to the Republican conservative caucus in Congress. And he said, you know, we had this arm in arm, I can't remember what they did, but in LA it was basically taking the streets back. Men came out and stood arm in arm around a, one of these diff, very difficult areas, arm in arm to demonstrate, no, we're gonna take this back. And we're showing solidarity. And he looked at it and he said, where were you guys? I didn't see any of you guys. Piercing comment. Exactly right. Now, I've got five kids. I rush from Washington back home. You know, we do what we can. First thing you can do, you've got to show up. And I think Paul's showing up. But he doesn't, he, he's, pulling, he's pulling this great understanding of what America's founding is, that it's not concentrated power just in Washington that matters. It's the other institution, the personal and private space out there that gives rise to the formative values and structures that are necessary for opportunity and therefore hope. Government has a place in trying to, again, create the just structures of society so that there is order. But without the mediating institutions of family life and faith life and Boys Town and other free associations out there, we can't spend enough fast enough to fix it all. And I think that's the point. We have a tougher sell on our side of the aisle because, again, fiscal responsibility message is just a tougher sell. It's easier to throw money at it, and it seems like that makes you care. It's not the money spent that's the measure. It's the outcome that's the measure. Mm -hmm. But in order for people to be able to hear that who are wounded, you've got to show up, and you've got to be authentic about it. And I think Paul is very authentic and is on a journey, journey of trying to convey this in a manner that he builds those relationships, I think. Well, no, I don't think I'm, I'm not going to say I think I know that. 
just want to go here. Did you have a question? Maybe a, a box of questions, so I apologize. Um, with, with regard to Catholic social teaching, can you think of any areas in which Catholic social teaching is significantly at tension with the Republican platform, not just in terms of rhetoric, but also in policy? And can you comment a little bit about you know, how that is resolved itself? The camera's still on? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think in style and substance, it has been intention. Again, we, we're, we talk in academic theories and economic theory rather than about persons, and that's been a problem. I'll grant that. Now, for the, the church, American church perspective, they have misappropriated the social justice teaching by looking at government as the main vehicle for the provider of social justice in the country. So the church has become, in a sense, uh, an affiliate of, uh, at least before now, an affiliate of the Democratic Party platform. And that's not correct either. The, so we have all of these, I mean, if you look at President Obama, for instance, he got his start in community organizing with the grant from the church. And now he, he, he says he has, he's turned around and, and, and basically using the arm of government to deny the rights of conscience, religious freedom, to people who claim a faith tradition that won't allow them to compromise on certain aspects of this health care bill. Wh how did this happen? And that's unfortunate. And at the same time, I heard President Obama in his State of the Union last year talk about a line that was not picked up by anybody, but I heard it. He says, um, I can't remember the exact words, I'm paraphrasing badly, he said, anybody can father a child. But we, what we need are people who will be a father to the child. Very beautiful line. So um, I think, again, in terms of style and rhetoric, we have to present this in, in, a, in a new way that is appealing to people, might be challenging. It's bitter medicine. It really is after, again, 40 years of, of living off of this. Um, we had, I'll give you an example. We had an ex we, I, I used to be on the Agriculture Committee. Now I'm on the Agricultural Appropriations Subcommittee. I was the chairman of the committee that had uh, oversight responsibility on our nutrition programs. So we tried to work with the government to reduce areas of fraud and, and, and waste in the system. It's not fair to poor people, other people who are abusing the system. And they actually, the inspector general used some of our recommendations to get it underneath this so we were able to save the system money. Uh, but then a, a cut to the food stamp, the SNAP program, gets proposed by Republicans, okay? In the committee, we had agreed in a bipartisan fashion, not perfect, people can say this should be more, this should be less, but that about a $20 billion cut would be appropriate to stop abuse of the system and without putting anybody who is in a vulnerable circumstances in terms of food security. Well, the, the, as the Republican agenda came out with a $40 billion cut. Now, again, I had worked on this middle ground 2023 20, billion dollar, which was ex generally accepted and moved you in the right direction. So you take up a $40 billion cut, which again isolates you and, and alienates you and frankly makes you politically vulnerable back to the old way of thinking that, oh, they're not interested in, in, in helping the poor. And, I thought, and, and, and it wasn't going anywhere. I thought it was an imprudent thing to do. And I said so internally. I vote against that. So um, anyway, I, it's hard. I mean, we the principle of subsidiarity demands that you focus on the mediating institutions of family life, faith life, business ethics, civic life. De Tocqueville comes to America in the 1830s. The Europeans didn't understand America. How, how, are, how is the society functioning? He says two things. America is good because uh, America is great because America is good. She ceases to be good. She will cease to be great. Mm -hmm. And that's because of her religious fervor. The second thing he said, America has lots of government, more government than France, but it's spread out. In other words, those institutions closest to the problem or the opportunity should be empowered to seize the opportunity or solve the problem. And we've lost sight of that as a church hierarchical in the last 40 years in their bureaucratic institutions, although that's shifting, to be an arm of government policy. While some of that may apply, 
in terms of large systemic ways to prevent poverty and abuse and important legacy programs. But we have to revitalize this understanding of the free associations of our culture where most of life is lived. I'll, I, I, one quick story, and I, I told Sean this earlier. I was visiting this manufacturing business in Lincoln. They make awards. I thought they were a trophy shop. They just distributed trophies. They make the stuff, all, uh, tool and die, torches, all kinds of, look like old Cleveland in the back of their shop. 50 people working there, many of whom have been there a decade or two, spent their whole life there, run by two small businessmen. We did a little town meeting like this. At the end of it, I said, Larry, was that all right? He said, Jeff, uh, the best thing was that you just came here to see uh, us nobodies. I said, what are you talking about? This is America. This is life. You created a community. You've given people good opportunity. You're doing well. They have stability. They're earning a fair and decent wage. Look, I've been on the top of the buildings above the clouds in Wall Street. This is life. And I think we've got some heavy lifting to do to regain people's confidence that we actually do care. Yes. Thanks for your honesty. I really appreciate your comments and all your training. And it's not just out of any sense of agreement, but just in terms of your inspiration of both theory and theology. You said something about how does the Pope personal view is I wonder whether Congressman Ryan as a Catholic would even be doing what he's doing had the Pope not been coming out so strongly on some of these issues. Um, so uh, it's just kind of a uh, wonder if it would even be happening. So yeah. I, I, um, I am appreciating the fact that the Pope is kind of calling us to question well, if you read, you probably, obviously you're learning, you've probably read Sincesis Masonis by Pope John Paul. That nobody talked about the challenging parts of that. Right. Very aggressive, challenging parts of that. Um, and again, I think the, the issue for the Pope is this, this seeming gap between, there, there's, there's three problems. One is it's identified as an income inequality gap. And that leads to inflamed political rhetoric about they're out to get you and this is not fair. <laughs> what it should lead us to is an examination of systems, again, that is concentrating wealth and power in a fewer and fewer hands and leaving entrepreneurial options off the table for people who, who could pick them up and run with them, whether that's, again, repressive government policies, too complicated health care system, uh, barriers to entry that the big guys can absorb the little guys can't. That's not what you want to see. That's called a true free market. Ryan had invented the word to, I think he did, I, I remember him saying it, crony capitalism way before Pope Francis' teaching. So I think he's on a journey in this regard, and, and, and clearly, I, I mean, I don't know that well. I don't have a deep personal relationship with him, but I, I, I think he's certainly motivated by um, these conversation about what is true and what is good. I saw him push back a little bit on the Holy Father's commentary because he said his uh, his his experiences in Argentina they don't they don't have a system that I don't know a whole lot about Argentina except my well, camera's still on but, uh, <laughs> uh, and so that his experience may not be coming out of a flourishing uh, free market that empowers small business and Main Street and persons to find good work. Um, but that's what we've got to return to. But it, it, again, but the factor that we're leaving off the table is this social fragmentation. How do you get there when you have this deep, deep, st deep structural poverty conditions because of woundedness in society? That's the harder, deeper issue that goes, that, that you don't hear many politicians talk about. I, I w frankly, we were, 
we were having some discussion on wage rates, and I went down to the floor of the House of Representatives and I said, okay, here we go. Our, I mean, unemployment extension. Okay, here we are. Here's a check for you. Hope it works out. Good luck. Goodbye. Is that the best we can do for someone who's unemployed? Is that the best we can do? And then the other side, back, kind of back to your questions, this so free movement of labor. Okay, you're 55 years old, and you, you lose a manufacturing job, and you have a house, and you have three kids and coming out of high school, and your mother is 80, and she lives down the street. You're supposed to just pick up and go somewhere else? That's a theory. That's an economic theory. That's not reality. What has trade policy done with countries that have, are not, I mean, you take China, for instance, a polluted society, unfair labor standards, unfair subsidies to their business. It's not a market economy. It's more of a command and control economy. It has elements of market economy, but is it fair? Is the level, is the playing field level there with us? You know, and so there's a whole host of questions here that have to be unpacked to get to the root causes of this. But we have to start trying and ignoring it. And, and Sean has kind of challenged me, saying this adult political space is the only place left where we can do this. Um, I've pushed back a little bit on that, saying some of this is beyond politics. It's, it's cultural. I agree that the politician has the responsibility to help lead in a cultural reformation. But it's got a, a person who's leading with no one behind them is a person walking around by themselves. <laughs> He's a surfer. If you don't have a wave, you're splashing around in the water. We've got to have a revival of people like yourselves who are obviously spending a lot of time in your, your evening who are interested in these deeper questions and who are willing to act and do something by, by getting involved in however is appropriate for you. Yes, ma'am. Don't make me repeat your name. No. <laughs> gay, Darlene, it's not a sexual <laughs> My dear mother named me gay. Say your whole name, though. I think it's delightful. Say, say your whole name again. Gay, Darlene, you die of death, Sutton. Thank you very much for sharing all your insights. And I'm not quite sure how to phrase my question, and perhaps you could help me phrase the question. very different in primarily um, in the theology of the Iglesia de la Liberación, liberation theology of the 80s. Supposedly the church was permeated of that, but yet you're still using the terminology of social justice. Secondly, my second observation is on one hand, politicians like yourself are essentially cannibalizing the rhetoric of the opposition. <laughs> uh, the believers in social justice and its radicalization. Um, number two, my observation is that there seems to be an inherent contradiction in what you're saying. Um, in the sense that the inherent contradiction contradiction appears to be between liberty and equality. If you have liberty, automatically you don't have equality, and vice versa. So I'm not quite sure what my question is, but I think it's somewhere in the back of my mind. I recall social Darwinism and its effect on society. Um, and for some reason, I can't quite Okay, let me try. Whoo, that's a lot. <laughs> Whoo, you wore me out. <laughs> well, let me try to just give some commentary, see if I can get close to helping think with you in this regard. Uh, in the, in the uh, 1980s, looking at what was happening in Central America, um, and again, not yet being on a pathway to Steubenville, where I was privileged to study theology and philosophy, I wanted to do something. I mean, in Central America, you had a proxy fight going on between the Soviet Union, in effect, and America. 
between this distortion of what it meant to be a liberated society and the notion of liberation theology, which was inclined toward violence to implement just solutions, which would then be basically giving in to the injustice in the first place. But it should not be to dis should not discount the realities of what were on the ground there. A, a colonial remnant of landed gentry who where you did not have a free society where liberty was the rule, repression is the rule. Um, yes, then along with the exploitation in reaction to other eras of that, a, a communistic disposition, which is a, a further form of repression of persons. Let's go back to the first premise we talked about. At the core of what we're talking about and what the core is saying, that each person has inherent dignity and therefore rights. The right of the person precedes the government. The government must always be interested in that first and fundamental right from which flows all the things which we enumerate, freedom of speech, religion, assembly, and all the things we take for granted here. Uh, I'm not going to wrestle with your liberty equality thing. I'd have to think more of that than uh, on the spot. But I would suggest that, again, a society that is built upon that premise and therefore governing structures that flow forth from that premise that protects the dignity and the right of the individual, the unborn child, the child in desperate poverty, the old person, and does th so through a robust set of institutions that are free first, which is family life and faith life, and again back to civic organization, therefore informs and keeps in check the power and the potential for the over, uh, overly concentration of power at the federal level. And I think that's the traditional form of America, and it wasn't without problems though. I mean, look, I, I represent two Native American tribes to Native American reservations. It wasn't until 1878 that Indians, Native Americans, were recognized as persons <laughs> with full rights under the law because Chief Standing Bear was coming back to Nebraska from Oklahoma where he did not want to be because his dying son said, Father, please bury me in our homeland. So he f leaves the reservation with his dead son and comes to Nebraska to just to bury him. He's arrested. The Omaha World Herald picks up on the case, the forerunner to the current newspaper that we have. A judge rules in his favor, and it's a beautiful story that we're trying to highlight, but, and I'm paraphrasing badly, but he stood before the judge, he raised his hand. He said, if I cut my hand, it bleeds red. If you cut your hand, it will bleed red. I am a man. God made us both. It was really, it, it was the first civil rights case, and, and it's very poorly known, and we're trying to, to elevate it. So we've had our own struggles, but at least we had a system in which we could adjust and overcome those struggles. A lot of places don't have the systems in place. They have the residue of colonialism and repression. They have a, an autocratic, bureaucratic governing system that's built upon bribery. bribery. They do not have free market systems reinforced by the principles of subsidiarity where free associations are the norm. Instead, autocratic, bureaucratic, oligopolistic, bribery-based systems are what controls things with some sprinkling of market systems. But there is a, an interesting story, too, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. The, the, the two men were talking. One was from Europe. And he was talking to his young son. And the other was American. And he was talking to his young son. And the American father put his hand on his son's shoulders. He said, son, you see that big house on the hill up there? He said, if you work hard enough and you stay with it and you have your sights set on that, one day you can earn that and that'll be you. The European puts his hand on his son's shoulders and says, son, you see that big house up there? If one day, w if you work hard enough and you stay with it and that's your goal, one day you can get that guy. 
See the difference? You see the difference? Nationalism, tribalism, ancient feud fights. When you start with a system that's inherent, which starts with building upon this idea, this grand idea of inherent dignity and rights, that again precedes government. Therefore, you build systems that are just. And you, but you've got to guard them. I guess the biggest point is each generation has to pick this back up and teach it to the one coming. And we've dropped that ball badly. And we've got to pick it back up quickly. Yep. Hi. Where did you come from? You. Oh. <laughs> um, so I have a question for you. Are we taking, okay, I, I'm free. I'm fine. I talk into the evening and I'm elected official. We can talk and talk and talk. But anybody that needs to go, please feel free. It won't hurt my feelings. Okay. Do you want to go and then you want to go? Okay. Did you have a question earlier? Sorry. Go ahead and then we'll go. <laughs> we'll do three. And I won't talk as much. I'll keep my part, part brief. All right. So a woman I'm very close to, and I really respect, Sheila Weber, runs an organization called um, the National Merit League. And, um, you know, she spends a lot of time sort of thinking about and talking about how um, or focuses more on, um, you know, keeping people together, keeping marriages together, as opposed to, you know, right. Or just seeing marriage as some sort of an agreement. Right, exactly. And you know, sort of hear usually Christian people talking about marriage. Um, and um, one of the things that she spends a lot of time focusing on when, when she's you know, speaking about this is the contribution of divorce and the destruction of wealth through divorce um, as a significant contributor to social inequality, uh, the rise of the college right. Oh, I, I, it's fact. I, I, yeah, no, it's not. It actually, the statistic is there that, it, and I'm summarizing this down to its essence. But basically, 80 percent of long-term structural poverty comes from broken or non-existent family structure. There's a direct correlation there. Now, again, back to the earlier point, and that's that's statistical relative. Rel uh, that's a, a, a statistical reality, um, but. We can't talk about this in terms of statistics. I think that's my message to you. That doesn't help anybody. You know, it, it, it's throwing a statistic out there is not going to motivate anybody. And it. Well, I. Uh, yes. Th yes. Yes. How do you? That's your. That's your responsibility too. Exactly. How do you? That's exactly right. And I think it, it, the, the splintering and fracturing of society, the the balkanization of society. Again, back to what I said earlier, Father Groeschel hearing not the confessions, but having conversation in the confessional with people who are lonely in New York City. I mean, you got people everywhere. There's nobody to talk to. Mother Teresa is saying, your, lo your neighbor's lonely and hurt. Go see them. Don't come to Calcutta. Same, same kind of thing. It, it will, it, 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 can that be generated by politicians? I think we have a role in that, in laying down a vision for society that is healthy and happy and interactive. The con that's why you hear the word community so much. Look, I live in the city that is, was rated the most positive outlook in America. We just, two weeks ago, we, we received the most positive outlook in America. That's where I live. Now, do you want to move to Lincoln, Nebraska? I don't know. <laughs> 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 but, but why? What are the elements that make people positive there? Well, it does have a good community spirit. It has lots of institutions, including government, that sort of promotes a community ideal. It has a very vibrant faith tradition in, in, in the community, Catholic, Lutheran, mainline, Protestant. Um, we have access, I mean, we have employment rate of, unemployment rate of 3%. We shouldn't discount how economic policy does potentially help or hurt, because when people can't find access to good work, a lot of stuff starts falling apart, including family life. But to simply only talk about economic policy as politicians leaves us wanting for more. And that's a, that's a trap that I, a problem the Republican Party has had, I think, in terms of talking just about economic theory rather than, the rea rather than first showing up like we talked about and talking about the needs of person. And then, then, then everyone, I think, is more capable of hearing us about the hard things that we, we, we need to talk about to get us back on track because it can take some sacrifice. So, yeah, go ahead.
said about the physically poor, so the materially poor. Um, and I'm just going to read this because this is what he said. It's actually really good if you do read what Volk said um, about this trickle-down effect. But he's talking about the materially poor. Um, and he says, in this context, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories, which assume that economic growth, if encouraged by a free market, will inevitably succeed in bringing de- about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power <laughs> and the sacralized workings of the preva- prevailing economic system. Meanwhile, the excluded are still waiting. And he's talking about the materially right. poor. And it's a great word, crude. Um, it's funny because I'm, I, mean, I, I work on Wall What are you, a hedge fund manager too? No. Okay. Um, but we live in a very wealthy area of New York City. Right. about people who are materially poor, a lot of Catholics, at least where I come from, and even my my social network, they miss the talking about materially poor people, and they, and they talk about, oh, well, there's spiritually poverty too, so you know we're all doing our best. But they miss the responsibility that we have to the physically poor. Um, and then the same thing, you know, you hear Rich Limbaugh, oh, he's a socialist. Okay, he's not, because this is what Adam Smith and Greenspan talked about, income inequality. So he's hitting something uh, like he's hitting something that is true and it's there. You even talked about in Boys Town and, and growing up yourself. But first of all, I guess my question is twofold. One is why are people missing that question as a Catholic? Why are we missing that 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 talking about the responsibility of the the physically materially poor? And then secondly, what action? What can we do about it? What should we be doing? I'm going to take his question. I'm going to come back to you, and then I will. Is that still on? I'll tell you a personal story that afterward, maybe we can turn that off. I'll tell you a personal story that I think is reflective of your an answer, but I'll, I'll go get yours first. I just want to say for, uh, very briefly, uh, you talked about uh, the possibility, I think you talked about uh, the possibility of, of, of making good judgments on a local level uh, in economy. So local bankers may better judge the local economy. Uh, what, there are certain values in place here. Um, how do you suggest uh, making judgments as good or as good as possible at a, at a more global level, so a centralized government or, um, or a process, you know, just a, a situation where there's possibility of, of, um, of communication through the Internet? Uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting question, and I've been um, – I interact a lot with the ambassadors from Europe. And one of the points we interact on is a potential new transatlantic trade agreement. Now, we tend to look at these things only through, again, an economic theory lens. By regularizing processes and procedures in commerce, we can become more efficient and elevate, or achieve higher outcomes, profitability. There's certain measure of validity to that, particularly with the Europeans. It is easily to enforce. and. The systems are more transparent and similar to ours versus other countries. And But I think the reason that I'm interested in the question beyond just that is this idea of creating a platform of governing structures and the civil societies that go along with it that empower people and help answer the deeper questions as to how do we get to appropriate development. What am I talking about? Well, if, if, if we harmonize with the Europeans, we're not only harmonizing economic systems, but we're basically harmonizing governing systems and the protection of labor and the protection of environment and the other things that in a lot of other places do not exist because th- they're not enforceable, it's not part of the governing culture, the systems aren't in place to take care of that to ensure, again, that free market outcomes uh, are, are present. So if that's the case, and we do that, suddenly you present a model for governance and ordering society that is very attractive to Africa, who wants to come our way, but the Chinese are all over the place paying them off and whispering in their ears, to Central and South America, who are in our hemisphere but who've been neglected for two decades, but have a same working philosophical premise of, of ordering society flowing out of the, the West that we do. 
I hadn't been to, I had never been to South America until two years ago. I've spent most of my time in Congress dealing in the Middle East. And when I went to South America, I felt like I was visiting cousins in very different society, in very different, uh, clearly language and cultural milieu. But the spoken words, the, the working set of premises behind, underneath the spoken words were similar. We're cousins. So again, to build the platform in which you create order and just systems of governance and civil society could be a very attractive to people around the world. Then it sets in stark contrast to other systems that are inhuman and are run by dictatorial influences or autocratic influence or based upon bribery or just enriching the few. I think that's a 21st century vision which keeps an appropriate amount of respect for differences of culture and how people locally want to work it out, the principle of subsidiarity, yet elevating certain ideals that we as leaders of Western civilization have been able to implement by creating orderly structure for the good of persons. I mean, we're sitting here having a free conversation, right? You can't do this in most places of the world. Don't be too hard on us poor politicians. Um, <laughs> try to revive your sense of, yes, our institution has problems, uh, but it's our institution that's American. Again, we self-govern. We're the ones responsible for the outcome. And who we send up there is going to be a reflection of us. And yeah, we got, it's not you in the narrow sense, but us in the broad sense, that we have, we have to have a sense of respect for our traditions and the institutions that carry forward that tradition. You can't just keep tearing it down. And by the way, the media is now divided up into base segments, and it makes money off of tearing it down every night. Yes, there are certain behaviors that are deserve scrutiny. I, I get that. But remember, relying on the media it, it is, it is in its for profit motive, some base values, but it's a profit motive. They're going to always exploit that which is emotional and dramatic. If you're not seeing um, uh, the hard work of a lot of good members who are trying in very hard circumstances to live with integrity, to not compromise themselves, first of all, but to try to push more America forward in the right direction. Um, there, there's a certain reality there of that. There really is. Um, but it's swamped. It's, it's, it's consumed by the, the tensions in society in general. The philosophical tension is very deep. I mean, the drama is played over and over hours and then we're all we're trying to survive internally while trying to govern at the same time. It's, it's tough business. So pray for your country, please. If you're a member, pray for me. Uh, I, have, I didn't get to talk about my family. I have five daughters, by the way. Um, a nun once told me, blessed are you among women. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Father Gabriel, and thank you, Congressman Fortenberry, uh, and thank you all very much for coming out. I